Hi, and welcome to the second video for General Chemistry 1. Today I want to start a discussion about what atoms are and what they're made of, and how we know about it. The process of finding that out is what eventually led us to build the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. You may have heard about the LHC on the news. It's a huge underground particle accelerator in Switzerland, over 16 miles around. For over 10 years, they've been doing amazing experiments where they smash subatomic particles together at speeds almost as high as the speed of light. The reason we do this is because when the particles hit each other, the collision tells us something about what the particles are made of. The LHC uses a lot of new technology, but the first experiment we ever did by smashing subatomic particles together was actually over 100 years ago, and it gave us our first clues about what atoms are made of. That's what I want to tell you about today. But to get there, we have to start way back, all the way to ancient Greece. In about 400 BC, the Greek philosopher Democritus first came up with the idea of an atom. He believed that all matter was made of tiny particles called atoms. They had shapes first described by Plato, and so the shapes are called platonic solids. They are the tetrahedron, the cube, the octahedron, the dodecahedron, and the icosahedron. Some of you might recognize these as the shape of some of the dice used in role-playing games, namely the 4, 6, 8, 12, and 20-sided dice. Democritus thought that atoms were hard and indivisible. They weren't made up of anything. They were as small as you could get. Unfortunately, there was no way to confirm Democritus' ideas about atoms, so they eventually were forgotten about for a while. In fact, it was almost 2,200 years before the idea of atoms was adopted again, and this time it was based on strong evidence. In 1805, John Dalton was studying the masses of different compounds, and he noticed certain patterns. Different elements seemed to have masses that were nearly multiples of each other. For example, carbon weighs about six times as much as hydrogen. Remember from our last lecture that hydrogen is a diatomic element, although Dalton didn't know that. So H2 weighs about two, we'll talk about the units later, and carbon can exist as a single atom which weighs about 12. This eventually led Dalton to the idea that every particle of a given element is exactly the same. All carbon atoms are alike, so they weigh the same amount, and the same is true for all the other elements. This made him realize that compounds always contain atoms that are in small, whole number ratios. In other words, molecules are always made of whole atoms. You can't have a fraction of an atom. For example, water contains hydrogen and oxygen in a 2 to 1 ratio, so we write its formula as H2O. The important thing is that the elements are in a whole number ratio. The same is true for sucrose, which is table sugar. It contains carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a 12 to 22 to 11 ratio. So its formula is C12H22O11. This idea that Dalton had, that the elements are in a whole number ratio, is called the law of multiple proportions. This works for all molecules, even very large ones like DNA or proteins or pharmaceuticals. For example, the chemotherapy drug vinblastin contains carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen in a 46 to 58 to 4 to 9 ratio. So its formula is C46, H58, N4O9. A few years before Dalton came up with this idea, the chemist Louis Proust had a great idea of his own. He realized that molecules of a given compound always contain the same elements in the same ratio. So for example, water always contains two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen. The ratio is never anything other than two to one for water molecules. Now it is possible to change the ratio. For example, you could have two hydrogens and two oxygens, giving you a molecule with the formula H2O2. But that means this isn't a water molecule anymore. H2O2 is a compound called hydrogen peroxide. This idea that a given compound must always have the same ratio of its elements is called the law of definite proportions. Try not to get it confused with the law of multiple proportions, which we mentioned earlier. After Dalton's work, the next big milestone in atomic theory came in 1897. In that year, 
J.J. Thompson discovered that atoms contain smaller particles that have a negative charge. These are called electrons, and you may actually see these if you have the right equipment in your lab. It's possible to create a visible beam of electrons in a vacuum tube. This is called a cathode ray tube, or CRT, and it was part of old-fashioned televisions and computer monitors. So we knew that atoms contained these negative particles, but we also knew that atoms have no charge overall, so there must have been positive charge in there too. Physicists at the time thought that the atom was a kind of little blob of positive charge with the negative electrons suspended in it. This was called the plum pudding model, because a plum pudding is a soft pudding with raisins in it, much like the positively charged blob with electrons floating in it. But was this picture correct? In order to find out, we had to perform the first experiment in which we collided subatomic particles together. It was done in 1910 by a team led by Ernest Rutherford. Rutherford was interested in the blob of positive charge that the atoms were supposed to be made of. He wanted to know more about it. What was it like? How thick was the blob? He came up with a brilliant idea to find out how thick the blob is. He and his colleagues made a sheet of gold foil. But it wasn't just any sheet. This one was so thin that it was just a few atoms thick. His idea was that he would fire a stream of alpha particles at this foil. Alpha particles have a positive charge. So when they hit the gold atoms, the positively charged blob of the gold atoms would slow them down. So, when the alpha particles got out of the gold foil, they should be moving slower. They would then hit a screen called a scintillator, which gives off a flash of light when the alpha particle hits it. Rutherford would use this to figure out how fast the alpha particles were going when they left the gold foil. So, he performed this experiment, and it didn't work. Or at least it seemed like it didn't work. The alpha particles weren't slowed down at all. They slammed into the scintillator at the same speed they had when they entered the gold foil. It was as though the positive blob in the atoms couldn't slow them down, or like the positive blob just wasn't there. They were trying to figure out what went wrong when they noticed that every now and then, the scintillator would flash at a slightly different location, as though the alpha particle had come out of the gold foil at an angle. When they looked into it further, they found that a small number of alpha particles did come out of the foil at an angle. In fact, no matter where they put the scintillator, they would always detect alpha particles. Most of them did go straight through the foil, but a few came out at an angle. And the number decreased as the angle went up. A few particles even came out 180 degrees from the direction they went in, as though they had bounced backward. So what was going on? Rutherford realized that he could explain all these results if there really isn't a positively charged blob in an atom. The alpha particles go straight through because the atom is mostly empty space, so there's nothing to slow them down. However, a few alpha particles do hit something, and when they do, they bounce off it. If they just graze it, the particles aren't deflected very much and they come out at a slight angle, but if they collide head-on, they bounce backward. That's why they were detecting alpha particles at every possible angle. This gave us a much more realistic picture of an atom. The positive charge in an atom isn't spread out, instead it's concentrated in a nucleus in the center, with the much lighter electrons swirling around it. And compared to the whole atom, the nucleus is very tiny. In the case of hydrogen, the width of a nucleus is just about one ten thousandth of the width of the whole atom. This means a vast majority of the alpha particles they shot at the foil were able to sail through without hitting anything. So that was the first experiment in which we smashed subatomic particles together, in this case, alpha particles and gold nuclei. And that's a good place for us to stop for now. We'll look more at what atoms are made of next time. I'll see you in class soon.